Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series for the months of October, November, December of 2018 entitled Oneness in Christ. And this particular lesson, the first one, is called Creation and Fall. It's for October 6th of 2018. You'll find it interesting, I think. Uh, let's begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we know that it was your plan to have perfect unity and harmony for all through eternity until our great ancestors, Eve and then Adam, chose to rebel your, against your words and condemned us to a sinful environment. May we, in studying these lessons together, learn how we might be able to do our part to remedy that problem is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As I have suggested on many occasions, I love to try to put myself into these situations. So now, I want you all to join me. Try to imagine what the world would be like if sin had not entered. What was God's original plan for this earth? My understanding know. that uh, God's plan was to try to educate the heavenly intelligences that were prior to this uh, creation and tried to hang on to as many as he could by educating them in uh, how they, into more of God's character. It, revealed, it was a revelation process on the part of uh, the infinite one. Okay. Myra, here's a question for you. Do you think Eve would still be having children? I wondered about that. <laughs> I read through this lesson. I thought about all the different things that need to come to an end. And how many children? How many children do you think she did have? She lived about nine hundred years. We just don't know. Have no idea. Was she fertile for that whole time? Probably if not. So she probably had a lot of children, hundreds yeah. of children. And we have to assume that Cain married one of his sisters. And you would wonder why would one of them choose to marry him? Maybe she thought he was the patriarch of the group. I don't know. The selection was probably rather limited for, for a while there. Yeah. <laughs> At least according to our record that we have. Yeah. Well, how do you think Cain, uh, Adams, and Eve's other descendants, and then uh, their in turn descendants, how do you think they related to Cain and his descendants? Well, they were warned not to harm him. Yeah. So, you know, what was that chapter four, Genesis? Mm -hmm. oh, don't, don't, Somewhere in there. don't harm him. Carrie, I think you have some words about that. Yes. Those who honored and feared to offend God at first felt the curse but lightly. While those who turned from God and trampled upon his authority felt the effects of the curse more heavily, especially in stature and nobleness of form. The descendants of Seth were called the sons of God, the descendants of Cain, the sons of men. As the sons of God mingled with the sons of men, they became corrupt and by intermarriage with them lost through the influence of their wives their peculiar holy character, and united with the sons of Cain in their idolatry. Many cast aside the fear of God and trampled upon his commandments. But there were a few that did righteousness, who feared and honored their Creator. Noah and his family were among the righteous few. And that's from Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 60, paragraph 2. Wow, that's quite a comment, isn't it? Yeah, I have a question about that. Yes. Seems like the ladies are always leading us into trouble. But who killed the, his brother? Yeah, exactly. Was there a woman involved there that... I hope not. <laughs> no. Uh, Dennis, you want to lead us on to another comment? Uh, well, I, uh, just to, since we're still on the uh, yeah, previous first. one, it says, a spe uh, curse more, um, felt the effects of the curse more heavily, especially in stature and noble, nobleness of form. And you wonder, 
what Later. that means. You know, mm -hmm. Did they get shorter and shorter on that side of the family? Uh, and did that carry on way down the line somehow? Was it yeah. from 12 feet to 11 feet? We don't know. Or what? We don't know. I don't know. So uh, this one is from uh, Christ Triumphant 39.2. After the translation of Enoch to heaven, the sons of men that were set against the worship of God were drawing away the sons of God. There were two parties of the world in the world uh, then, and there always will be. The worshipers of God called themselves the sons of God. The descendants of Seth went up into the mountains and there made themselves homes separate from the sons of Cain. Here in their mountainous homes, they thought to preserve themselves from the prevailing wickedness and idolatry of the descendants of Cain. But after the exhortations and the influence of Enoch were removed from them, they commenced to unite with the descendants of Cain. Wow. That's so, something. So was Cain, pardon me, was Enoch, by Enoch being translated, did that cause more corruption on this planet? Sounds like it, isn't it? That's what it sounds like. Sounds like well, of course, if you, read, if you read e the story of Enoch and in the writings of Ellen White and a little bit in the Bible, uh, it clearly says that he, ha he, he had a, carried a pretty heavy influence. He was out talking to people, convincing them that they should, you know, straighten up their lives and so forth. And he would, after a while, he would become so concerned about the evil that was going on in the world that he, he would go off by himself for a while just to sort of renew his... A relationship with God, so maybe God should have left him here. Well, taken him later in life, huh? Anyway, <clears throat> well, they were given an opportunity, uh, and uh, and they made their choice. Uh, yeah. But we'll talk more about that as we yeah. go on through the lesson. Clearly, God's plan was for the Garden of Eden to expand to include whoever would be living there, eventually, presumably, to cover the entire earth. But as we know, that plan was foiled by the sins of Adam and Eve. After they were expelled from the garden, things deteriorated very rapidly. Cain killed Abel, and Cain had the very, that very sad argument with God. So why did the antediluvians deteriorate so quickly into moral depravity and wanton sin? In Noah's day, was there truly only Noah and his family that were faithful enough to get into the ark? Well, at the time of the the rains finally fell. Of course, Methuselah died that year, mm -hmm. so he would have been somebody righteous up to that point. And there may have mm -hmm. been others who were building, helping to build the ark over the course of 120 years, if depending mm -hmm. on how you reinterpret that, uh, who may have died before yes. then. So, but at that point, there were only the eight. Wow. And some wonders about the eight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some very serious questions about the eight after when you read what happened afterwards. Well, <clears throat> thinking back now over, we've, we've covered a considerable period of time. Jumping back to, let's look at some more questions about this. What, when questioned by God, where did Adam and Eve get the idea that they should blame someone else for their sins? They had never, nobody had ever said that, done that before. No one ever suggested that before. Where did that come from? Well, increased self-awareness and decreased awareness of God and his character. The, the spirit was taken from in the, them and they, the light went out. So they were dependent on their surroundings for input about God rather than having it internal. Mm -hmm. So uh, they became helpless, basically, yeah. in terms of moral sensibility. And when you want to protect yourself, you and you're smart, you can come up with things. You know, it was yeah. not my fault; it was their fault. You know, that happened almost immediately. Yeah, yeah. you know, I didn't. I, it was my fault it's because that we're we're good at that because we've had lots of practice, yes. but. <laughs> Well, it wasn't very long, and well, I shouldn't say it wasn't very long, it was quite a long time, but in terms of the biblical story, uh, the next major character is Abraham. 
And I want you to think about how you would feel if you got this kind of a message, for, uh, the message that God said to Abram. Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your relatives and your father's home and go to a land that I'm going to show you. Now this wasn't at a time when you just jump on a jet and go back home and visit your family, you know. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless all the nations. What was the intent of that? Covenant. A covenant. That was the first covenant, agreement, right? So, so my understanding of that is that Abraham was supposed to be the, the influence to the world and gradually uh, influence the world to come to God. That's, what, turn that's the, what Israel later was supposed to do. Turn the direction of society around, huh? Yeah. Wow. Well, Romans 4, 1 to 5 tells us that a Abraham was basically the the father of the saints, if you will, he was the first great example of righteousness by faith. So did Abraham get chosen and his family line get chosen just because he was a good guy? I mean, surely we believe in God's foreknowledge. Did he recognize what was coming in Abraham's descendants? Um, well, man looks on the outward appearance and the Lord looks on the heart. So he must have seen something in Abraham that he thought uh, was, was better than uh, the uh, other alternatives. Option, the other al alternatives he had. So uh, he saw potential and mm -hmm. chance to grow there. So, do you think Abraham was really the only one that God called, or did God call a whole bunch of people, and only Abraham responded, or we only have the record of Abraham? Well, where would, we, where would we look to find out whether that might be true? Well, the example comes, comes to me as uh, Ellen White mm -hmm. being called as a prophet. She was the third one in line. Mm -hmm. The other two said, nope, not for me, God. Well, I, I would like to go back to Abraham's day. What about Melchizedek? Well, Abraham didn't move on all that fa rapidly, didn't he? He, no. he took a sojourn. Well, he, we, we, apparently God led him down to Haran, which wasn't very far from his home. And his father died there, and then finally he, he launched off, and he, he went from a place where things were fairly comfortable, and they had probably some kind of plumbing and houses, and spent the rest of his life living in a tent. Well, maybe uh, his father may have had a revelation because the original plan was that they were all going to this uh, promised land in Canaan. Uh, I'm speculating because mm -hmm. he may have had temporal reasons for doing that, but maybe he was the original one and when they got to Haran said, this looks pretty good, let's just stay here and gave up. So I don't know. I'm tired of traveling. <laughs> Well, Gordon, you have some interesting insights, I think, there into how, what kind of a person was Abraham, what kind of influence did he have? This is from the book Education by Ellen White. God called Abraham to be a teacher of his word. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law. And that which gave power to Abraham's teachings was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, <clears throat> many of them heads of families, and not, a <coughs> excuse me, and not a few but newly converted from heathenism. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Of Abraham, God said, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. Yet his authority was exercised with such wisdom <clears throat> and tenderness that hearts were one. The testimony of the divine watcher is, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. And Abraham's influence extended beyond his own household. 
Wherever he pitched his tent, he set up beside it the altar for sacrifice and worship. When the tent was removed, the altar remained, and many a roving Canaanite whose knowledge of God had been gained from the life of Abraham his servant tarried at that altar to offer sacrifice to Jehovah. Wow, Education, page 187, paragraph 2. That's incredible insight. Um, we know, yeah. yeah. So do you think that God wanted the Canaanites to offer sacrifices to him there, or did he want them to worship there, or remember God in some well, way other it, than a sacrifice? In the old ancient days, sacrifice was pretty much equivalent to worship, wasn't it? As far as we know. And as long as they associated this with... Abraham built this, mm -hmm. there would be some connection then to the true God, although that could be lost over time. So what is Abraham doing with a thousand people in his household? He doesn't have a single son or daughter. He had a lot of property, well, a lot of uh, livestock, yeah. cattle, sheep, camels probably. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and had to protect re those. remember that when it came time for when Lot was captured, when the valley and went off was taken by that group of roving kings that conquered the valley down there, Abraham went after them with what? 318 of his private soldiers. Obviously, these people must have been the ones who protected his flocks to keep them from being stolen. Well, man, a life. I mean, this is a whole city on the move. Well, they, you know, trying to put yourself in the society back then, you know, if you weren't one of the people who was going to be the big leader of a group and you were sort of at loose ends, uh, he would have been an attractive person to, uh, to uh, affiliate, with. affiliate with. You know, he, he had Eliezer of Damascus somehow he, that we don't know how that relationship mm -hmm. developed, but there would be others perhaps who saw in Abraham someone worthy of, you know, if I'm going to unite to somebody or some group, uh, he looks like somebody who would be mm -hmm. good to follow. So, well, and the, and uh, and I agree with that completely. The point is, he apparently led them in a very Christian, very God-fearing way. That's what's kind of amazing. The whole rest of the world seems to be going downhill about as fast as they could go. I mean, before Abraham, way before Abraham, we already had the, the Tower of Babel. I think he was a strong personality, but not a dictator. Yeah. They probably felt safe with Abraham. Yeah. He's not going to rip me off. Yeah. When I, when I sleep at night, he's not going to come kill me and take my wife and mm -hmm. children. Yeah. And so it was... So as his group started to grow, those people who were treated well would then pass yep. that on to any and that's anybody who is at loose yeah. ends and say, this is a, a place you may want to be. But apparently he m made a regular practice of getting people around his house and, and talking to them about God and you know converting people out of paganism. That, that's amazing. Well... Try to imagine yourself going back again, and we're jumping around quite a bit in this lesson, but bear with me. Try to imagine yourself as one of the angels standing around the throne of God, waiting to his bidding as they watched Eve approach the tree of knowledge of good and evil, talk to the serpent, take the fruit, and then give it to Adam. Would you say, hold it, wait, 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 wait? I mean, what would you do if you're one of those angels? They waited for the command that didn't come. Yes, they were not, uh, they didn't just do their own will. They right. did the will of the Father. And, and there we have the story, in, right there in creation, that man was supposed to be ruler of all creation. You know, we, we see these pictures that they draw of heaven. Um, you know, lions and lambs and all sorts of stuff, you know, romping and playing together. So another question that comes from way back then, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? 
Do we look like God? Not so much anymore. <laughs> Not so much anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there may be some general similarities, but so, Adam, you know, when God, when the Lord came walking in the garden, uh, he may well have looked much like them. Mm -hmm. uh, more glorious, of course, but uh, there's no reason to believe that he was some eight-legged something yeah. or other. You know? Yeah. When I was a freshman medical student, Jack Bravancha was teaching the religion and ethics class, and this was one of the questions that he posed very early in that session. Write a one or two page description of what this means. Mm -hmm. So we had to think about it for a while. Uh, okay, so you have the answer for us. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what, did I'm the on, what did you get on the test, though? What grade? <laughs> it wasn't uh, that kind of a test. It yeah, was just yeah. a thought question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but well, are our characters supposed to be like God's? Now that should, yeah. I mean, we, I think we have pretty good evidence for that from the rest of Scripture. Are we supposed to act like him? That's the goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, theologians have debated those questions for millennia. They, in fact, even the question of what's the nature of God himself. Well, talking about the nature of God, we have passages like 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Let's have a quick look at that. And verse 16. Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God. Whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. And if you drop down to verse 16, it says, And we ourselves know and believe the love which God is for us. God is love, and those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. Uh, excuse me, that's a pretty clear description of what God is like, isn't it? If it was all that clear f for, to everybody, we would probably wouldn't have over 33,000 different Christian religions <laughs> as of about 15 years ago. So uh, apparently, the, the truth must be in the minority. Well, of course, what's the problem? I think most, if not all, probably not all, but most of those churches say, oh yeah, we believe that. But what happens, what happens when it comes time to actually that, live it out? But their definition of love sure. is probably a popular run rather than understanding that it is a principle. And then what flows from a principle as, a as opposed to a feeling. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we would have to agree that in terms of the creatures that live on this earth now, human beings are capable, not saying they do so well, but they're capable of being the most loving of any of the animals, any of the, any of the creatures on this earth. We had the privilege of visiting Alaska two, three weeks ago, and we found out about the habits of bald eagles. The bald eagles, they mate for life, they build themselves a gargantuan nest, and they keep adding to it every year, and they stay together while they're raising the young, and when the young fly away, mom goes this way and dad goes that way, and they disappear until it comes time to have kids again, then they come back together. That's an interesting <laughs> way to do things. Why is it that so many of us have trouble loving today? We all know that more than 50% of marriages end in divorce. That doesn't sound like truly loving, does it? Well, well the spirit war wars against the flesh. Sure. If we're sowing to the spirit, we will walk in love if we sow to the flesh then we'll reap corruption as as the scripture says so so what was God's original plan for marriage forever yeah forever and what what else they were supposed to be equal that was God's original plan now you're preaching heresy I'm preaching straight out of the scriptures careful <laughs> 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 but now let's what <laughs> <laughs> well, you can be equal and still be different yeah sure you have different skills or well, okay now here's the, the happy marriages have one of each yes okay 
If we have trouble getting along with one spouse in our day, how will we live for eternity with people from all cultures, all generations, from Adam's time to ours? Is learning how to get along with our spouses and our children a preparation for heaven? Yes. Would be nice. <laughs> and, and other members of the church. Yeah, also. It's an eternal goal. Yeah. Are you saying we don't have that goal yet? Uh, it's a goal. Well, we Jesus, Jesus prayed that we'd be, we would be one as the Father and Him are one. And except for a short period of time after Pentecost or at Pentecost, that prayer has not been answered. Mm -hmm. When we talk about, well, my prayers aren't being answered, here's an example of a prayer of Jesus that is not being answered. And what are we doing about that? Are we seeking his face and c coming to know his will more clearly? <laughs> and are we learning to love one another even when we disagree mm -hmm. about things? Yeah. Well, here's God's words to Adam and Eve. And he said to the woman, I will increase your trouble in pregnancy and your pain in giving birth. In spite of this, you will still have desire for your husband, yet you will be subject to him. And he said to the man, You listened to your wife and ate the fruit which I told you not to eat. Because of what you have done, the ground will be under a curse. You will have to work hard all your life to make it produce enough food for you. It will produce weeds and thorns, and you will have to eat wild plants. You will have to work hard and sweat to make the soil produce anything until you go back to the soil from which you were formed. You are made from soil, and you will become soil again. That was Genesis 3, 16 to 19. Genesis 3, 16 to 19. Wow. Well, women will have pain in childbirth. Men will have to work hard to get the ground to produce its bounty. More than that, for some reason, it was at that point that Adam and Eve were told that they could begin to eat vegetables, referred to in some translations as wild plants. Why would that be? Because they're not good. <laughs> You have to kill the vegetable in order to Oh, eat. I love vegetables. You do. Well, except that the animals before the fall ate the, the plants. Yeah. If you go back to Genesis 1. Yeah. They were. 29. There was a different, uh, you know, people were just the fruits and the th things. So I, I'm not sure how that uh, relates. Well, one, one issue here. Um, but I see, you know, what you mean. You, you know, if you take a fruit, then the tree is not really harmed. Uh, yeah, but, but we don't know uh, what the vegetable you DNA of a vegetable when you ate half of it maybe before the fall. Well, it may have it didn't kill the plant. Yeah, if you yeah. grazed on the grass, as, as yeah. the yeah. cows might have done, it it comes back. You know, it's not unless you got some animal like yeah. uh, um, locusts that well, destroy everything. So if you re eat a real vegetable that's good, f like a potato, then you have to kill it to eat it, essentially. Yeah. Spinach, you don't have to kill. You just take a little bit. Yeah. Well, we're, of course, we're assuming that what we see in this yes, day and age is, right. is what they were looking at back then. Things yeah. may have changed a whole lot yeah. since then. Well, let's take another look really briefly at the story of Cain and Abel. What happened there? The, uh, we, we assume from the story that Cain grew primarily vegetables and fruits and plants. And Abel apparently at least had a significant number of sheep and cows and so forth which he used for sacrifice. Is it possible that Cain decided that he wouldn't follow God's advice because he didn't have any sheep and cows? Would he have had to buy one or get one from someone else? I'm, I, I'm just speculating. I don't, what do you think led to his... The nature that uh, Adam and Eve used to blame somebody else came through and came. I don't need to do it. Cain chose to worship God in the way he wanted to worship God. Does that sound vaguely familiar to anybody? How do, we, how do we distinguish between worshiping God the way He wants and the worshiping God the way we want? Well, if we don't worship the way 
that is the right way, you're going to become have other gods. Yeah. It, it, it don't. One of the first uh, suggestion is or prescription is don't have any other gods besides me. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the infant yeah. one. I'm not yeah. talking about myself. We know very little about the society before the flood. Much of what we as Seventh Day Adventists know is from the writings of Ellen White, which gives us a little more information than what's just in the Bible. Why do you think those long-lived, very intelligent people fell so quickly into, ver into perversion and sin? Couldn't they, they live so long, I mean, couldn't they see the consequences of sin? Not about intelligence. Uh, some of the spark, you know, it, as a psychologist told me one time, we like to think we do things for intelligent reasons, but <laughs> by and large we do them for emotional reasons and then we use our intellect to justify them. So the smarter you are, the better you are at rationalizing whatever it is you want to do. But why do we want to do wrong things? Well, uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, boastful pride of I life. Think Lucifer, so, so God made us in the wrong way? No. I think Lucifer and his henchmen were active. Yeah, and they didn't have as many people to work on in those days. No, but they could hone their skills, couldn't they? I mean, they yeah. were there. He got Adam and Eve to do it. But the first thing is to humble yourself under God's hand you know, in, in one way, uh, or to fear him or, or respect him. In other words, if we take our eyes, uh, in fact, as, where is that? As Ellen White says, uh, um, the reason are so many, why so many are left to themselves in places of temptation is they do not set the Lord always before them. When we permit our communion with God to be broken, our defense is departed from us. Not all your good purposes and good intentions will enable you to withstand evil. You must be men and women of prayer. Your petitions must not be faint, occasional, and fitful, but earnest, per, uh, persevering, and co constant. It is not always necessary to bow upon your knees in order to pray. Cultivate the habit of talking to the Savior when you are alone, when you're walking, and when you are busy with your daily labor. Let the heart be continually lifted up in silent petition for help, for light, for thought, for knowledge. Let every breath be a prayer. That's Ministry of Healing 5, 10, and 11. Wow. So okay. the same thing exists there. If they don't continue to focus on God and his, his, what he has revealed, then they will wander off into, into evil. Okay, let's put ourselves in another situation. Try to imagine yourself as it's starting to rain, either inside the boat or outside the boat. What would you be thinking? Did the people inside the boat wonder what that strange noise was that was on the roof? Remember this? This apparently was the very first time it had ever rained. And the people outside would also be wondering. They'd have a little more awareness, <laughs> not just, they'd have visual uh, instead of just auditory. How long do you suppose it took them to decide they, they should be in that boat? <laughs> really quick. A foot of water? Yeah. Maybe sooner than that? Well, we know that uh, after the flood, they got out, and what did God tell them? That he wouldn't destroy the earth. He, and he's going he's to gonna, he's gonna give us a promise, affiliated with the rainbow, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So why is it that sin causes so many problems? Because it's not part of God's will. Okay. Selfishness is the very centerpiece of Satan's government. He does not really care about anyone else except himself. And what do you expect? It, it should be easy, I think, for us at this point in time to recognize why selfishness leads to such incredible disunity and disharmony. Well, look at the Tower of Babel story. What was going on there? They were going to beat the system. Going to beat the system. Okay. Why did they choose? They moved down, apparently from the mountain area, down into this valley, and here they are between these two lush, big rivers, 
and the, the ground, I'm sure, was very fertile in those days. And they thought, boy, this is a perfect place. And pretty soon, other people are gathering around. Boy, this looks pretty good. And suddenly, there's a city. Is that a good idea or not a good idea? Well, God's idea was to scatter. Yeah. So look at verse 4, Genesis 11, verse 4. They said, now let's build a city with a tower that reaches to the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. And what was God's plan? Well, he corrupted their language so they couldn't talk to each other. And so it says, the city was called Babylon because there the Lord mixed up the language of all the people. And from there he scattered them all over the earth. So it sounds like gathering a lot of people in one place is not such a good idea. Is that true? I only got to look at the headlines today, you can see that. There was a zoologist I, back in the uh, late 60s. He had written the, the human, or let's see, The Naked Ape. Mm -hmm. So his follow-up book was The Human Zoo. And what he said is when you take the animals out of the wild and you put them in close confinement in the zoo, they exhibit all the same perversions and, and dysfunctions that people in cities do. Yeah. So that was his basic premise. Yeah. So there's something about putting people in closer proximity that... I have right. traveled a lot around the world. And if you travel to places where people are really jammed together, pretty soon they care. And there's a country I won't name by I won't give the name of, where you can travel along and there are bodies, human bodies, lying beside the road. People have been hit by cars or something else like this, and nobody even bothers to pick them up and bury them. It is really, really sad. Well, we don't know very much about the early history of the people. We know about this group that uh, went down into Mesopotamia, and, and the archaeological evidence suggests that a lot of people lived there. There were a number of cities there back in early human history. One group that we know something about are the Sumerians. And why do we know about the Sumerians? Because they wrote it down. They invented writing, as far as we know. Now, it was a strange form of writing. We don't have much of it to work on, but we've deciphered some of it anyway. But they had nicely built houses. They produced many precious things, such as jewelry, tools, and household utensils that have been recovered by archaeologists. Uh, and we know that in that valley, there's still a lot of sort of towers um, existing. So why would someone want to build such a tower? to do what they wanted, not what God wanted. Well, okay. Well. And they didn't trust God to not do it again, even though he said he Would, wouldn't. Yeah. So. They didn't trust God. Any other reasons? Some people suggested they were hoping to build a tower that was high enough to see what was up there in the clouds. Maybe they could figure out why it rained. I don't know if that was one possibility. Um, others people suggested they, they were hoping to build a tower high enough so that even if it did rain again, they could rush to the top of the tower and survive. Who knows? Although those, the pictures of people draw, you'd think, could all of those people yes. get all the way to the, the, the was the room, yes. or are they going to be pushing each other off? Yeah. It's only important that the president the and, the, yeah. and the elite get there. Yeah, I see. So what factors are that make it difficult for us to get, uh, get along and to cooperate with each other? We, I mean, there are certain things that are obvious. We're different in, in, we have different languages, we have different cultures, we have different races. I mean, those are just a few of the most obvious things. Um, and language and race are, are significant factors, but culture is obviously the big one. If you were raised with certain, what we call values, certain ideas about what's right and wrong, and then you rub elbows with somebody who has quite a different idea about what's right and wrong, it may be hard to get along initially. So how are we going to resolve that kind of problem? 
takes a lot of love. Mm. Well, let's think about it for a minute. Abraham, for example, is the father of the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism first, Christianity next, and then Islam. Um, he's considered to be the great example of faith. And God says all the nations of the world were supposed to be blessed through him. Um, we've, we've already read that he had got thousands of people, people from pagan backgrounds and so forth, that came and made themselves a part of his household. Apparently he knew how to pull people together, pull people together somehow or other. Well, there's, um, and I'm not going to read these verses because we, we're running out of time. I'll, I'll read just a couple of them. Look at Galatians 3, 28 and 29. So there is no difference. These, of course, are Paul's words. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. So did Paul believe that culture doesn't really matter, that language doesn't matter, that race doesn't matter? In terms of salvation, Okay. Uh, for sure. He still seemed to uh, find ways in love to work within the slavery issue, mm -hmm. Philemon and the situation yeah. there. And, um, he, uh, but he tried to bring the Gentiles and the, the Jews together, but he mm -hmm. had to, even then he had to be like a Jew in one place and be like a Gentile in another yeah. place. So there were, in order to bridge the gap. Well, going back to Abraham, and again, I apologize that we're jumping around so much. Uh, I'm, f I'm following the lesson, believe it or not. Uh, what made him a great example of faith? I suppose a lot of people, huh? Well, you have it there in the text. Uh, obedience and his, mm -hmm. his willingness to do things that seemed, well, that you just couldn't see from a human standpoint would work out. Mm -hmm. Well, God promised him a land. Would If you God said, I'll give you a nice place to live, would you just launch off to wherever, not having any idea where you're going? Hebrews tells us that the whole time Abraham was looking for a city built by God. Well, then, of course, um, there was that problem of a child, a son specifically. Did, did Abraham hang on all that time because he was waiting for God to fulfill his promise? Do you... Do, do, do you Try to imagine conversations going on between Abraham and Sarah. Imagine Sarah finally saying, well, maybe you better take my, my maid, Hagar, and we can have a child to her. That's hard for me to imagine. It's hard to imagine, but having gone through experiences with others, not being able to conceive, you're almost desperate. Mm -hmm. You know, not and, almost desperate. And, yeah, you are desperate, and for them to have an heir was so important that it was the culture. Well, and not only that, it was God's promise. It was God's promise, yes. But I mean, somehow Abraham didn't seem to seek God in the matter. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, and so we could say, well, Sarah led him astray with this uh, outrageous plan. But then later, when uh, Sarah wants to send Hagar away, and Abraham is, God tells him, no, listen to the voice of your wife that this time. But mm -hmm. maybe, uh, maybe at that point, Abraham sought God's. Well, there's a couple of verses I'd like to read to you. It give us some light on that. Look at Genesis 17:17. 17, 17. God had said to him, you're going to have a son. Abraham bowed down with his face, touching the ground, but he began to laugh 
when he thought, can a man have a child when he is 100 years old? Can Sarah have a child at 90? He asked God, why not let Ishmael be my heir? Wow. And then we go to the next chapter, chapter 18, starting with verse 10. One of them, one of these three visitors to Abraham, said, nine months from now, I will come back and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now, I don't know. Myra, how would you feel if some, pe some strangers you'd never seen before came to your house and said, oh, I know you've been trying to get pregnant for a long time. Nine months from now, you'll have a son. And you're yeah. 90. Yeah. <laughs> no. Sarah was behind him because she wasn't supposed to be part of the group, but she was listening at the door of the tent listening. Abraham and Sarah were very old and Sarah had stopped having her monthly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, now that I'm old and worn out, can I still enjoy sex? Besides, my husband is old too. Then the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child when I'm so old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? As I said, nine months from now, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Because Sarah was afraid, she denied it. I didn't laugh, she said. Yes, you did, he replied. You <laughs> laughed. You know, I here are these, people, these great saints, these great examples of faith, and they're, you know, lying to God and laughing at him. And Wow. Is that uh, what good friends do? Well, laughter is kind of spontaneous. <laughs> yeah. Someone defined it as a surprise to the mind. Yeah. So this certainly would have counted as a surprise to the mind, and you, <laughs> you laugh because it's so... Do we ever laugh at God's promises, or do we even doubt them? I mean, know really what they are. Yeah. Um, if a number of us really followed God's plans for our life, if we could really figure out what they were and we really followed them, would that hasten the second coming? Second Peter chapter 3 seems to suggest that. Considering what you know about the ancient peoples and all their foibles, do you think it was a good idea for God to choose Abraham and his descendants? I'm not going to question God's Yeah, We don't know what his plan. other choices were. <laughs> we have to what, about, what about choosing us? It's questionable. <laughs> questionable. Okay. Again, I say God has chosen everyone, mm -hmm. and there are very few that have accepted his call. Yes. And, That's important. And even some of us may not have accepted that call mm -hmm. in reality. That's a good answer. Yeah. In trying to answer the question of why God chose Abraham and his descendants, it's important to read Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 11. And I'm going to just read that. Do this because, now this is Moses' final message, uh, although this may be, it's one of his three, last three messages. That, I think it may be the first one. The last month of his life. Do this because you belong to the Lord your God from all the people on earth. He chose you to be his own special people. The Lord did not love you and choose you because you outnumbered other peoples. You were the smallest nation on earth. But the Lord loved you and wanted to keep the promise that he made to your ancestors. That is why he saved you by his great might and set you free from slavery to the king of Egypt. Remember that the Lord your God is the only God and that he is faithful. He will keep his covenant and show his constant love to a thousand generations of those who love him and obey his commandments, but he will not hesitate to punish those who hate him. So now obey what you have been taught. Obey all the laws that I have given you. Pretty straightforward comments, isn't it? Well, did God choose the descendants of Abraham because Abraham was his friend? Or did God know in advance what they would do? Did God know that they would be perfect examples of all the bad and the good that might happen? I don't think we're here in a position to limit God's foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about how we choose leaders in our day. They, we tend to choose people who are supposedly have exercised power, wisdom, self-confidence, sometimes way too much self-confidence and some kind of leadership skills. God chose people who were few in number, they were weak, they had recently come from slavery, and they were despised by their neighbors. Uh, is that the people you would choose? 
Of course, he actually chose their ancestors, Abraham, mm -hmm. Isaac, But remember, if you, if you believe in the foreknowledge of God, he knew this is what he was going to end up with. That didn't, yeah. that didn't mean that they had to do that. Mm -hmm. They could have chosen other. There's a phrase that goes, how odd of God <laughs> to choose the Jews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, Jim, you have something about God's original yeah, plan for my, them? It's my turn. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Myra. Don't leave me out now. No. <laughs> no, no. Uh, this is from Christ's Object Lessons. God desired to make his people, Israel, a praise and a joy, a glory, sorry. Every spiritual advantage was given them. God withheld from them nothing favorable to the formation of character that would make them representatives of himself. Their obedience to the law of God would make them marvels of prosperity before the nations of the world. He who could give them wisdom and skill in all cunning work would continue to be their teacher and would ennoble and elevate them through obedience to his laws. If obedient, they would be preserved from the diseases that afflicted other nations and would be blessed with vigor of intellect. The glory of God, his majesty and power were to be revealed in their prosperity. They were to be a kingdom of priests and princes. God furnished them with every faculty, every facility for becoming the greatest nation on earth. That's from Christ Object Lessons, page 288. Well, we need to remember that one of the unifying factors that God has always promoted was the keeping of the Sabbath. Think of all the ways in which a group coming together, worshiping together on the Sabbath, are benefited and brought together as a, as a, as a group. Um, Jim, I think you have something on that. The Sabbath and the family were alike instituted in Eden, and in God's purpose they are indissolubly linked together. On this day, more than on any other, it is possible for us to live the life of Eden. It was God's plan for the members of the family to be associated in work and study, in worship and recreation. The father as priest of his household, and both father and mother as teachers and companions of their children. But the results of sin, having changed the condition of life, to a, a great degree prevented this association. Often the father hardly sees the face of his children throughout the week. He is almost wholly deprived of opportunity for companionship or instruction. But God's love has set a limit to the demands of toil. Over the Sabbath, he places his merciful, merciful hand. In his own day, he preserves for the family opportunity for communion with him, with nature, and with one another. Ellen White, Book Education, 250, paragraph 2, also in Child Guidance. Do you think it will ever be possible for, I mean, looking around us, even among church members, do you think it would be possible to, for God to have a large group of such people living together in perfect harmony in the city of God? I think in God's foreknowledge, I might mention that in this book, Education, there's a page a statement there that education is redemption, or edu redemption is education. Every, that's everything boils down to the, uh, our Father who art in heaven. The Father has a duty to teach his kids, or the parent has a duty to teach the kids, and that's the only thing God could do is educate. Uh, otherwise, you're not free. You can't control, you can't intimidate and persuade at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we've already talked about the challenges of language, of race, and especially of culture. Um, Think about what happened at Pentecost. The disciples were able to, from that point forward, to speak fluently and well every language, whatever language of whatever place they went to. Would that, would that help to resolve the problem? Certainly would be a start, wouldn't it? And I wonder, in order to speak a language, really, in our day, you have to understand the culture. You can't just, you may know about the words, but if you, 
if you use them inappropriately, people wonder what in the world is going on with you. Um, is it God's plan just for us to tolerate one another? Or does he actually want us to become more and more like him, and as we become more and more like him, we would become more and more like each other? More and more like God is... Uh, huh, it's... Uh, that's the only, only way it's going to work. You can't uh, do it any other way. Well, another possibility would be that as we come together, we, we come to understand other cultures and we, we appreciate them for what they are and we don't expect them to change. Um, could that be possible? Well, you know that God didn't have many choices with Adam and Eve, and we don't have chance time to look at those. If you want to get our handout um, on our hand on our website at theox, that's t h e o x dot o r g, you'll see about what some of those choices are. Are Ellen White brings us to these very interesting comments. That I want to close with the most convincing argument we can give to the world of Christ's mission is to be found in perfect unity. In proportion to our unity with Christ will be our power to save souls. Bible Training School and also in Our High Calling, page 170, paragraph 4. Another one. A true, lovable Christian is the most powerful argument than, that can be advanced in favor of Bible truth. Uh, that's from Review and Herald, January 14, 1904. A well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot gainsay. Patriarchs and Prophets, 144, paragraph 3. A kind, courteous Christian is the most powerful argument in favor of the gospel that we can produce. Let us remember that a Christ-like life is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Christianity and that a cheap Christian character works more harm in the world than the character of a worldly. So, are there ways in which we could work with other church members that we, that we live among and so forth and bring about these kind of relationships that would really make a difference in our world? That's your challenge. Our kind and loving Father, we have covered a lot of material, a lot of time in this lesson. Um, all the way from Adam and Eve to Abraham and his descendants. Um, we wonder about the lives of many of those people. We know so little about them. But Lord, some of them turned out to be great examples of faith. May we learn something from their lives that will help us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.